1330 WSPQ. The following program is a public service of Classic Hits 1330 WSPQ. The opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily represent those of WSPQ staff or management or its sponsors. This is 9 a.m. Open Mic. Listen each week at this time for interviews and insights from interesting guests in the Tri-Counties. Here's your 9 a.m. Open Mic host, Fred Heyer, on 1330 WSPQ. Well, New York saw an on-time budget approved this year, but what other positives or negatives for the legislative session in Albany? We'll find out about that today. My guest is uh, State Senator Patrick Gellivan. We thank him for being on Open Mic today. Thanks for being here. Glad to be here, Fred. Well, let's talk a little bit about the legislative session in Albany. How would you characterize this year? I think it was another successful session. Um, I, I think we can do more. Uh, let me say, first and foremost, we can do much more than what we've done. But you, you first mentioned an on-time budget. We've now had four on-time budgets in a, in a row. We've had a self-imposed spending cap where we have kept spending, state spending below the rate of inflation. In two of the years, we've reduced state spending. The Senate has reduced its own budget in spending by $7 million. We've made some gains on mandates, provide some relief locally uh, for local governments with a new pension, Tier 6, with uh, a state takeover, the portion of the local share of Medicaid, and we're trying to do what we can to help businesses. Everybody in New York uh, received some sort of tax cut in the past several years, businesses included, and we're trying to focus on regulations uh, as well to try to remove some of the impediments to, su- to businesses succeeding in New York State. Okay. So those sounds like some of the positives. Were there some negatives? We have a long way to go. I mean, those, those were the positives, of mm-hmm. course, but many of these things were incremental changes as opposed to significant changes, flipping a switch and turning us completely in the right direction. Our starting point, uh, when I started in the Senate four years ago, uh, followed two years where we had $14 billion increase in taxes and fees in the state. In New York State, at the very bottom of every single list, 50th in being the highest taxed in the country, 50th in being the least friendly to business, 50th in the amount of regulations, and so on. So we have crept up on some of these lists, but we're still 47th, 48th, 49th. And we have a long, long way to go. The frustration is that change can't happen quick enough. And I, I'd say that is the biggest negative. But I think many positive things are happening, and we are doing some things that are putting us in the right direction. Okay. So there are, were there specific, you mentioned some of the things, were there specific items that you liked in the budget that you would like to see go farther then? Or were there things that, you, that didn't get through the budget that you want to see somehow enacted someday? A number of different things. I'll, I'll hit on a, a couple of them. Some of the larger, one of the largest components of the budget outside of Medicaid is aid to education. I think it's in the neighborhood of $22 billion going out with state taxpayer money to local school districts, K-12 through education. Back in 2009, 2010, the state was having pretty severe fiscal problems. As I mentioned, they taxed anything that moved. At the same time, what they did, they had a significant budget gap. And what they did at the time essentially was suspend using the school aid formula and grabbed a bunch of money from that to eliminate the gap. Um, Hence, they call it the gap elimination adjustment. Mm -hmm. And it's really put a severe bind on schools, including Springville Griffith. So what we have tried in the past several past several years is to try to eliminate that gap elimination adjustment so that the schools are fully funded according to the formula. We've we've made gains. We're on track to eliminate it over a course of a three-year period, two more budget cycles. This past year, uh, we put over $600 million towards eliminating that gap, but the gap stood at nearly $2 billion. The governor early on came out with a budget uh, that I don't think treated our local schools too kindly. In the Senate, Uh, upstate senators, largely representing areas like Springville, Southern Erie County, Wyoming County, school Mm -hmm. districts like that across the state, stood up and really, I think, made significant inroads. And uh, to give you an example, what we were able to do in helping to eliminate that gap and help our local schools is the end result of the budget, we were able to secure over a half million dollars more for Springville Griffith Institute than the governor's original budget. But we have a ways to, I'm not suggesting that we greatly increase aid to education, but we need to 
close that gap because mm-hmm. money is being taken away mm-hmm. from what the the formula by law is supposed to provide mm-hmm. and Secondly, we have to ensure a fair funding formula, and it is not fair for our local rural schools. Um, It is weighted towards large suburban schools, in some cases city schools, a different formula for New York City, and Mm -hmm. we need to work to change that. So that's something that I spend quite a bit of time on. The other thing I spend quite a bit of time on, uh, or one of the other areas I spend quite a bit of time on, is small businesses and regulations, trying to work to ease that regulatory burden. We have over... uh, three quarters of a billion over 770,000 regulations in New York State. Last year I co-chaired a industry specific series of regulatory reform hearings across the state to identify impediments to business. We asked people in various industries, agriculture, manufacturing, health, medical, and so on. We asked them to identify what were their biggest impediments to doing business in New York in the way of regulations. And these industry experts identified over 2,200 regulations. And so we have a blueprint to try to do something about this. We made some small gains. There is a, a, a regulation uh, where employers have to duplicate things in notifying their employees about their pay, their hours, pay rate, et cetera. We were able to eliminate that. That saves employers $181 million across the state. Clearly, we have a ways to go. Mm. We also look to advance New York, New York and the Senate district I represent, uh, which includes Southern Erie, Wyoming, Livingston, and Southern Monroe County, their number one industry, agriculture. So I spend quite a bit of time on that as well. There certainly is enough to keep me busy. And then, then of course, we deal with many different constituent issues and their frustration with the bureaucracy of the executive department in New York State, whether it's the State Liquor Authority, Department of Motor Vehicles, DEC, and, and agencies like that. So we do stay busy. My guest today on 9 a.m. Open Mic is uh, State Senator Patrick Gallivan. We're talking about this uh, legislative year. You mentioned education aid, but uh, some of the, one of the things that seems to be a concern uh, is con- the Common Core. It w- was it pushed too quickly or not uh, implemented correctly? Uh, 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 is there, can there adjustments be made, or is it just too late? Let's just go with what we got. I think a combination of that, the combination of pushed too quickly and implemented poorly. If we take a step back in time, the nation's governors essentially uh, decided to step things up, and each state has a representative on a council that has to do with K-12 through education. And ultimately, New York was among the states that participated and said, we are not competitive. When we look at what's taking place in other countries, our kids are not keeping up, and we want to raise our standards. So that, in essence, is what the common core is. The implementation has created a significant amount of frustration, and it, it's been kind of a, a vicious circle. Now, states and local school districts can still um, put together their own learning methods, their mm-hmm. own curriculums, teach and evaluate the way that they choose to, in many cases, uh, with some restrictions, of course. Mm-hmm. But the idea was uh, the set of higher standards was, was put out, and teachers were being evaluated on kids test results the kids were being tested on things that teachers had no idea uh, how to teach or what to teach because the learning materials weren't available for the new standards Mm -hmm. and it was all backwards Mm -hmm. Um, so rather than rolling it out in a proper fashion and and doing it in the right way training teachers uh, training local school districts making sure School districts have the proper materials. Teachers are prepared prepared with the new materials. Kids have time to absorb the new material and then are tested accordingly. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't that way. It was completely backwards. So clearly, it, it, the the expre- the frustration expressed to me by school districts, by school boards, by many parents, and I think has now been documented and pretty much understood as the the rollout was completely flawed and completely shoved down everybody's throat. And so what we did this year, we essentially, uh, we didn't say we'll take a time out. We'll say, what we said in the legislature, let's just slow it down. Mm-hmm. We've got to take some steps to make sure that it's implemented properly. And I think that we've done that. Um, we'll see this upcoming school year. I work very closely with the school superintendents across the district and with many of the school boards. So we stay in regular touch with them and, and do what we can to stand up for them um, in the state. And hopefully the changes that 
the legislature has made this year, th that we've made this year, are appropriate and will prove to be the right types of changes so that as we move forward with this, it's done properly. Now, you also mentioned small business. Now, you had, you had a forum here at the Springville Country Club, I believe, on, on small business or on business forum. Was that right? Am I right about that? We did. We, we have actually brought on a small business advisor. Uh, we look at the, sm the businesses that we have throughout the district, and, of course, small business being the, the lifeblood of many communities across New York State. And it, we, we work with our chambers on a regular basis, and ultimately what we put together is we put together – a, what we call the Small Business Summit, and we did a couple different things there. First, uh, it was I, I had a role in it in essentially reporting back to the citizens, the in this case the small business citizens, of the things that I am trying to do to properly represent them and stand up for them, and some of the changes, some of the things that we're advocating that affect their local small business. And then, of course, to hear their feedback about what their problems are with Duplicati duplicative reg regulations mm -hmm. with regulations where the cr cost greatly exceeds the benefit and so on. So that was one part of our summit. The other part was we brought in an expert, somebody who has uh, significant experience, spent a lifetime traveling the country, in some cases internationally, working with businesses, with organizations, with management, with marketing, things of that nature. And essentially the other half of the program that we put on in this case was a marketing program for small businesses and so uh, we've we received great feedback from the businesses they were both appreciative of uh, the information provided uh, f from New York State or the relevant things that uh, how New York State and the regulations affect their businesses and greatly appreciative of our expert that we brought in to talk marketing to talk to them about how they can help their businesses succeed and grow in western New York. So we, it's something we got great feedback. We've done it across the district, and we'll continue to do that. Now, is this a break time between the legislative session, or are you guys getting to get called back to Albany at any time? Our regular session typically goes from January through June. Mm -hmm. It ended the third week of June this year. This year has been no different. Mm -hmm. The only way that we would be called back uh, into session in Albany between now and the end of the year would be either the governor or the Senate Majority Leader would call us back for a particular purpose. Some years we go back, some years we don't. But does, despite that, we still have committee meetings that go on. Uh, during these the last six months of the year, I typically am in Albany at least once a month with various committee meetings and other commitments, things of that nature. Last year I traveled the state conducting a series of regulatory reform hearings um, in my capacity as conference leader for economic development. We work very hard in the district and try to be out and about throughout our four counties in the district. And very often what we do in the summertime, like we do now, is try to make sure that I visit every single town and village and community. And we stay involved in many constituent issues. So just because we're not in Albany in session doesn't mean we're not working. Matter of fact, I, I think I put in more hours back in the district than I do in Albany. Um, it, it has been very interesting and rewarding, uh, but I think the importance of me being out and about in the district is actually engaging with the people that I represent to make sure that I'm properly representing their views when I take my votes and when I advocate or oppose the, the, the different things in Albany. What do you hear from constituents when you go out? What, I mean, is some of the same things we've been talking about, or are there other things? Or I think I continue to hear frustration about taxes, overall taxes, uh, not necessarily that if, uh, whether they're state taxes or school taxes or local taxes, but frustration that our taxes remain high as compared to uh, people who have family down in the Carolinas or in mm -hmm. Florida and other parts of the yeah. country. From businesses, I hear that we, we are overregulated. I continue to hear that frustration. And then we, then we hear, um, in, in some cases, some frustration, especially out our way, with the New York City interests, with a governor who comes f from New York City with an assembly that's New York City-centric. And that's what's very important this upcoming election with the legislature. I mentioned 2009, 2010, we saw an increase of $14 billion in taxes and fees. At that, that time, the state budget was $90 billion. So there was an additional 15 nearly 15% increase in taxes back in 2009, 2010. But anyway, uh, many individuals and businesses express frustration when they see in the news and they hear things uh, that are coming from a New York City-centric assembly or a New York City-centric governor 
who seemingly don't seem to understand our way of life and the things that are near and dear to us. The SAFE Act, mm -hmm. I think, is a very good yeah. example of that. So I, it really, it is the same thing. People, I, I think, have, exp well, no, I think, I know they've, they've been very appreciative, very wonderful um, in expressing their thoughts to me and in giving me their opinions, both good and bad. Yeah. But I think they recognize that I try to properly represent their interests, the interests of our way of life out here. But from business, I, I think it is taxes, the high cost of government, and the impediments of regulations. And from people throughout western New York here in Springville as well, it still is the, the high taxes and government seemingly involved in more and more in so many different things in our lives. And it's a common sentiment is, hey, stay out of our life. Mm -hmm. you know, please listen to us. Respect us. Uh, we understand that we have to pay money for some of the services, whether it's police, our local government, snow plowing, things of that nature. But let's not do these ridiculous things. Let's not overburden us. And please stand up to fight for our way of life, life as opposed to that New York City-centric, what I think is much more liberal uh, thinking than than the people that think out here where we live. And it doesn't matter whether the Democrats are Republicans. It mm. still is a complete different way of life in New York City. And it's important that the local representatives stand up and try to educate the New York City representatives that they still have, when they're voting, their vote impacts every citizen in the state, including the people in western New York. Our guest today on 9 a.m. Open Mic is State Senator Patrick Gallivan. we got about four minutes to go here. Now, recently been in the news is this former Moreland Commission, which was set up to, to find public corruption, but the governor stopped it, and then uh, now I guess a, uh, a, a U.S. attorney in the Southern District down, or down that way wants to keep it going. But the, what has been kind of the impact of this? Has your office gotten questions, subpoenas, or what's the whole thing? I mean, they're looking. They want to make sure that everybody's functioning right, that nobody's doing anything wrong, obviously. I think the the impact right now is uh, you've seen a lot in the news o about the governor, people raising, raising questions whether the governor interfered with the operations of the Moreland Commission or not. What were the governor's intentions in establishing the Moreland Commission? Was it really to root out corruption or was it a play to try to uh, influence the legislature to enact some sort of ethics reform or campaign finance re reform? And I think what it's done in some cases for the people that have uh, seen this in the news and that have raised questions is it is raised questions about people's trust in government it's another thing it's uh, oh gosh there we go again mm -hmm. speaking out of both sides of their mouth what is it does he really want to root out corruption mm -hmm. or does he want to get his way or what's the real story there unfortunately I, I, I don't have an answer because I'm not privy to the governor's office mm -hmm. or to what went on behind closed doors and now of course with the U.S. Attorney taking a look at the operations of the Moreland Commission uh, it is subject of an investigation that nobody has access mm -hmm. and, and anything the U.S. Attorney does including federal grand jury is by law confidential mm -hmm. and so I think it'll be a while before we learn about it but certainly we would hope that the truth for all of these matters would come out. One of the things that Moreland did uh, when, when is looked at the camp uh, financial disclosure statements of all legislators, all 212. And that's really okay that they, they looked at all of them. They looked to review to make sure that the filings are done properly, mm -hmm. that um, spending is proper. And so what we did when we became aware of those are the things that they're looking at. Well, we make sure that our spending is consistent with law and, and compliant with law. We have always tried to endeavor to make sure our campaign filings um, all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, and they're fully compliant with law. And what I've done once the Moreland started doing its work and and people raise questions overall, I directed our campaign people to review every single line of our filings, every single penny spent to make sure that everything is uh, properly filed and consistent with law. And they have done that, and, and I'm very confident that we're in full compliance with the law. In our own office, I can't speak for other legislators, mm -hmm. but we have a very good group in Western New York, mm -hmm. and and no doubt everybody is trying. They're really trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might make some mistakes with filing, but the law provides an opportunity to correct. And really, what's important is that it's done right and that it's transparent. And I think going back to the original question mm -hmm. with Moreland and the governor, 
we have questions whether it was done right and whether the process was transparent. And I think that's the purpose of the U.S. Attorney's investigation to get to the bottom of that. Okay, we'll finish up here. You said it's an election year. So what kind of goals do you have for re-election uh, coming back? You get re-elected. If you get re-elected next year, what do you want to do? What do you want to see happen? Well, I'm very fortunate that I do not have an opponent this year. Okay. And I... I would, I would like to think that that has to do with how hard we work. We have a very talented and committed, dedicated staff, our community representatives, our communications director, our, our legislative people. We work very, very hard, and we're very active in the community. We'll continue to do that. Uh, we really focus on our constituents to make sure that we're properly representing them. And when people call with an issue with the state or wherever, if they call and ask for help, we try we try to help um, if we're able to. That's on the constituent side of it. In the representation and focusing on issues, I focus on trying uh, the small business, uh, the regulations, the size and cost of government, fiscal responsibility, trying to reduce the size and cost of government, trying to eliminate the regulatory burden, looking at education, trying to make sure that K through 12 education is properly funded and it's done in a fair and equitable manner and that has to do with the gap elimination adjustment and the funding formula. We pay a lot, of, we will continue to pay a lot of attention to try to advance the interests of New York's number one industry, agriculture. Interesting to note that despite it being New York's number one industry, we spend less than one half of 1% of the overall state budget on New York's number one industry. Hmm. And I think we should be focusing as a state on advancing our number on our number one industry. Our, uh, we, we continue to focus on local, uh, uh, on transportation dollars, the CHIPS funding, mm -hmm. trying to make sure that we continue to fund our, our local governments and help them with our local roads and bridges. Locally, 219. Uh, that is one of our priorities, the mm -hmm. old 219 bridge. It is right at the top of our list. We've worked with the DOT. They've assured us they're going to keep it open. We have to continue to watch that. Mm -hmm. We do know it's going to be replaced, and when they do that, we want to make sure that it's done in as expeditious a fashion as possible so there's as little impact to the local businesses like we saw in, in years past mm -hmm. when it had to be closed for various reasons. So we'll continue to focus on those, those larger issues, focus on our constituents and try to help them in any way we can, but above all, try to make sure that I'm properly representing their interests to the point that I would hope that if I'm, if I'm doing it properly, I am voting the way that they would vote if they were sitting in my seat. My guest today on 9 a.m. Open Mic has been uh, State Senator Patrick Gallivan. Thanks for coming in today. Very happy to do it. Thank you. This has been 9 a.m. Open Mic. Listen each week at this time for interviews and insights from interesting guests on 1330 WSPQ.